today's session is one that I'm going to be co-leading with Kristen O'Connell, and I'll ask Kristen to introduce herself in just a second. Um, and I'm Jory Weintraub, by the way, and I am part of the ARIS training team. I'm one of the co-PIs for ARIS, um, biologist by training, but for most of my career since grad school, I've focused on science outreach and research impacts and science communication. So I sort of dabble in those spaces now. Um, and I will be talking today, along with Kristen, about a program that we've been running at ARIS for a couple of years now. And um, I know some of you here have participated in the past and others hopefully are new to ORIC and will be learning a lot about it. Um, so I'm going to start, I'm going to take about 15 or 20 minutes at the beginning just to give you an overview. And then I've invited Kristen O'Connell, who's part of our evaluation team, to uh, uh, to talk about some of the evaluation data that they, they have collected from the first two cohorts. Uh, and then with, with whatever time we have left, 15, 20 minutes, we'll open it up to questions, uh, Q&A, comments. Um, I'm already seeing several people here who have participated in ORC in the past or will be in the future um, in the coming cohort. And so there will be some experts with personal experience that they can share on this. So um, lots of people to ask questions about. So, We'll get started uh, with my slides in a second, but Kristen, do you want to take a second to quickly introduce yourself? Sure, yeah. I'm Kristen O'Connell. Um, I work at the Science Education Resource Center at Carleton College. Um, I, like Jory, I have a background in science. I am a geoscientist by training um, and moved into education research and program evaluation um, after um, bouncing around a few different careers. <laughs> uh, and I um, really value working with the ARIS program as we really like to focus evaluation on sort of a developmental approach where we're giving rapid feedback and the, that data is helping shape the program um, as they move forward. So that's, um, it's a really fun space to work in. Yeah, and we have been so fortunate to be able to work with Kristen and her colleague, Ellen Iverson um, from CERC as evaluators. They're absolutely the best evaluators I've worked with in, in the past and, and a real joy to work with and are doing wonderful things for uh, ARIS. So i um, glad you're gonna be able to hear from Kristen in a few minutes. Um, all right, so again, we're, I still see people are, are still arriving, but we're gonna go ahead and, and jump right into the slides right now. Again, please um, feel free to turn camera on if you would like, but keep yourself muted. If you have questions at any point during this session, um, you are welcome to put them in chat and we'll do our best to respond to them at the time. You can also virtually raise your hand uh, and we'll call on you if you have questions that way. You don't need to save your questions till the end, although there should be plenty of time at the end for question and answer. All right, so what is ORIC? Well, ORIC is a program um, that the, the official name, and let me just back up, the official name is Enhancing Organizational Research Impact Capacity, and that's a mouthful, so that's why we go with the hopefully at least nominally better acronym uh, of ORIC. Um, I want to just kind of give a quick shout out to the ORIC team, uh, because ORIC is definitely not just me, it's a team project, and uh, there are several of us within ARIS who work on this. So the main folks who work on ORIC are myself, Megan Heitman, and Janice McDonald, who make up the training team at ARIS. And um, this is a recent picture. We, we had an ARIS meeting in Durham, North Carolina, where I'm based, and took in a Durham Bulls game. And um, Janice wasn't able to make it to the game with us, but um, there are Megan and I um, sitting with Wooly Bull before the game. Uh, so, so the three of us are the training team, and, and we're sort of the boots on the ground people for, for ORIC. Um, but of course, uh, our fearless leader, Susan Reno, who, as you all know, is um, executive director of ARIS, PI of the ARIS grant, uh, vice chancellor at University of Missouri, um, is very hands-on, very involved with ORIC as well. And that's, um, that's Susan sitting directly next to Willie Bull and me giving the bull fingers over her head, if you picked up on that. Um, I also want to acknowledge Brenda Kidwell and before her, Mary Beth Bone, who were um, essential, who have been essential in providing administrative support for ORIC. We couldn't do it without them. And then, of course, the evaluation team you just heard from Kristen and her colleague, Ellen Iverson, was at the game with us. You can see her in the, the back left there. Um, so 
Uh, this is a team effort and we couldn't do it without everyone contributing. So I want to make sure that we give credit to all for that. All right, I don't need to really tell you all what Eris is. If you're here, you know what Eris is, but just sort of by default, I put in the standard, this is the Eris. Um, you know, this is what Eris is slide, just so we'd have it here. Um, we'll remind you that Eris really is made up of a few different initiatives, um, among them training, partnerships, and scholarships. As I said, Janice, Megan, and I are um, make up the core of the training team. And, um, uh, you know, historically what we did with training uh, at, at ARIS and prior to that when we were still called NABI um, was really sort of an ARIS centric or ARIS out model where um, someone on the training team, you know, myself, Janice, Megan, or Susan, or um, Sarah Vasmore, or someone else from ARIS would, would travel to an institution, to a university, to run a workshop, you know, two hour workshop, half day workshop, sometimes full day or even multi-day workshops. Um, and then once the pandemic hit, um, we started transitioning a lot of that over to webinars, but it was still really an ARIS out model where it was someone from ARIS talking to people about research impacts. And, um, you know, that worked great. At least we like to think that worked great for the people who were in the room or who were on the webinar and were able to participate. but. What we realized was that if you weren't in the room or on that webinar, then you, you really weren't having an opportunity to get the benefit of our discussions as an ARIS training team. Um, and so it was really sort of that, you know, that brought up that model, you know, the old, the old saying about if you give a man a fish, they eat for a day. If you teach a person to fish, right, they, they eat forever. And so, um, you know, that we were sort of giving out fish, but we weren't really teaching anyone to fish. Uh, wrong direction, sorry about that. Um, and despite what Ron Swanson might say, uh, fishing is not easy, right? To, to become really competent at um, supporting your institution with research impacts efforts, um, it, you know, it's, it's something that, that maybe some people can pick up on their own, but we really felt that one of the most valuable things we could do within ARIS was to set up a program where we were helping to empower people um, so that they could become the experts within their institution or within their organization so that they didn't need to bring one of us there to run a workshop so that they could run workshops and so that they could really enhance and expand what their institution might already be doing with research impacts. And so out of that, the ORIC program was born. And, um, you know, just to give the, the quick sort of summary of the objective of ORIC, it's to empower institutions and organizations to build or enhance their internal capacity, their own internal capacity to support research impacts efforts. So, you know, some institutions are already underway with this process and, and we can help them along with that. Others really haven't started. And so we can help them sort of just figure out how to jump into this and start from the beginning. And so ORIC has tried to do a combination of both of those things. A few key elements of ORIC, it's a one-year cohort-based program. Um, you apply to be considered part of a cohort, uh, and I'll show you the makeup of the cohorts in a few minutes, but we started with five in our first pilot study, and, um, and now we're sort of open to anywhere in the five to 10 range um, as we're working with our, our um, third cohort uh, that's just starting now. Um, but it's a one-year commitment on the part of the institution to be a part of this. Um, it's really kind of a, a train the trainer program. So we provide training, mentoring, resources, and community building to help the institutions in the cohort start to invest in and develop and ramp up their RI infrastructure. Um, it's built around what we refer to as the, the RI team or the research impact team. And this, we'll talk more about it in a second, but this consists of an RI professional or RI professionals um, as well as a, an administrative partner. And we'll see more about those two roles in just a moment. Um, and then finally, it's a program that's built around a series of milestones. And so I'll take you quickly through those milestones in just a moment. And the ultimate goal of all of this, sort of the, the dream metric for this, uh, for us would be after a year of participating in ORIC, an institution is so heavily invested in the idea of research impacts and has made such great strides over the course of the year that they uh, you know, dedicate resources to create their own research impacts office at their institution. 
Um, and that's kind of the pie in the sky goal, but it, it's a achievable goal. Um, but, but we realize that not every institution is gonna have the capacity to create an RI office after one year. Um, but you know, it might look more like creating a full-time position or even you know, carving out time in the positions of people that are already working in some aspect of research development to, to become experts and focus on research impacts. Um, there, there's really a spectrum of things that we would consider a success. And in the two years we've been doing this, we've really seen everything in that spectrum. So, um, you know, Kristen will talk more about some of the evaluation data, but we're seeing things as far as, you know, um, the commitment to creating offices or creating full-time positions. So we feel in that sense um, that we've already made some great progress with ORA. Um, but again, that's, it's not the only metric of success that you create an office, but that's sort of the pie in the sky goal. All right, let me just talk a little bit more about the, these two terms I've shared with you, the research impact professional and the admin partner. So the research impact professional or the RI pro is what we often refer to as the boots on the ground. Um, this is the person or people that are gonna be most likely to have direct interaction with researchers at the institution. And that direct interaction can take the shape of training um, or workshops or individual consultations to help people develop the broader impact sections of their proposals, or maybe consultation on evaluating broader impacts activities, um, in some cases, even uh, collaborating to implement um, broader impacts activities. Um, but all of these are sort of direct interactions. So that's why we call this the boots on the ground role. And when we originally envisioned ORIC, we saw it as um, a program where there would be um, a, a single research impact professional or RI pro at each institution in the cohort. Um, I, I don't know why, other than just that sort of historically, um, and many of you are research impact professionals as well, you may have seen this. Historically, it seemed like there was always sort of one person at an institution that by default became the go-to person uh, for research impacts work and broader impacts work. But what we found really quickly was that a lot of the um, institutions participating in ORIC um, actually had multiple people, two or three different people who were involved in various ways with research impacts. And, and they said, can we have a research impacts professional team? And you know, we've tried to be really flexible throughout this program. And especially because the initial effort was a pilot study, uh, we said, sure, why not? Let's, let's be open to the idea of a research impact pro team. And um, as it's turned out that, that that's become a very popular model. And so we're seeing more and more that members of our cohorts are taking this RI pro team approach where they'll have um, multiple two or three different people at their institution who will participate as RI pros. We still do have some where they have a single RI pro and either one is fine from our perspective. But that's the RI professional. The other role is the administrative partner. And what we realized early on as we were sort of brainstorming ORIC was that if we simply focused on a train the trainer model where we helped, um, you know, provided resources and mentoring and training for the RI pro or RI pros, then all of the expertise would exist within that group. And, you know, if, for example, they left the institution to go somewhere else or retired uh, or, or whatever, then sort of the commitment and the, the institutional knowledge about research impacts would leave with that person or with those people. And really our goal was, again, to, to, to teach people to fish, right? To build longstanding institutional commitment to enhancing RI support and infrastructure. And so to do that, we realized we needed more than the boots on the ground people. We also needed someone that we call the administrative partner, which is someone who's situated at a, a middle to upper level of the institutional administration and really has the ear of the, at the highest levels of that institution so that they can serve as a champion for the efforts of the RI pro or the RI pros and, and really drive institutional support and buy-in for the commitment. Um, and typically what we've seen with that is one person at each institution who served that administrative partner role. And, and so the RI pro or the team of RI pros combined with the admin partner make what we call the research impact team for each institution we work with. And we really feel that that RI team approach has been essential and that this idea of pairing the, the boots on the ground people with the administrative people has been a key to the success of ORIC thus far. All right, I, I mentioned that we build this program around a series of milestones. I won't take a lot of time to talk about them, but just give you a sense of some of the things 
that are baked into the ORIC program. Um, one of them is uh, really right at the beginning. Um, so we've just accepted our new cohort, which we're calling cohort two. There was the pilot, there was cohort one, and now cohort two. Um, and the first thing we do is we jump right into a weekly summer training series. And this is just sort of a train the trainer, very intensive, you know, one hour a week, but, but every week throughout the summer, um, immersion in all things research impacts and research impacts training. Um, so a lot of professional development, a lot of training goes on during this um, month long, or sorry, three month long summer training series. Um, this is set up primarily for the research impact professionals, the boots on the ground people, although um, the administrative partners are absolutely welcome to attend these and some choose to do that as well. Um, I saw earlier Cornell Hart is on this call. Welcome, Cornell. Cornell participated in the past cohort and was the administrative partner but also sat in on all of the summer training series events. So uh, she can, you know, um, during Q and A at the end of the session, she could certainly, if she's willing, share her perspective on that from the admin partner perspective. Um, in addition, we ask uh, each institution to develop what we call the research impact landscape through an RI landscape survey, um, where we ask them to, to basically uh, do an assessment of all of the research impact resources that are available both within their institution and throughout their community, just to, to create a landscape of where they stand currently with research impact support. And again, we will ask them at the end of the year long commitment to update and revise that RI landscape so that you know our evaluation team can measure sort of gains and increases over the course of the year. Um, similarly, we work with them to develop at each institution a database of potential research impact partners and again, these could be partners within the institution or throughout the local community. Um, but this is a, a database that's going to be extremely critical for them as they provide consultation and support with researchers at their institution. And so we give them the training and the tools and the support to develop this database, which they can then use as an essential tool for their, their RI support work. We ask them to develop a website uh, to share with their community and their institution the services that their office or their um, their group provides, as well as an evaluation plan that, so that they can evaluate, their administration can evaluate how successful they are in their RI support efforts, which will be crucial as they strive towards long-term sustainability of those efforts. Um, and then really the meat of this is that we ask um, them, the RI professionals, to start delivering research impacts workshops and trainings. And all of the resources PowerPoint presentations and other resources that we on the ARIS training team have developed over the last 10 to 12 years, we make accessible. And uh, we give those resources basically to everyone who participates in ORIC. Um, and they can use those resources as is. They can modify them to um, make them specific to their institution, or they can toss them in the trash and start from scratch if they want. But we that's part of what our commitment is with ORIC is to give all of our training resources uh, make them accessible to members of ORIC. Um, and then finally, we ask them, as I've mentioned before, to start conducting RI consultations and meeting with researchers and grant writers at their institution, either one-on-one -on -one or in small groups, to give them consultation and feedback and ideas and suggestion uh, to help them do a better job of coming up with research impacts ideas and writing that into their proposals. And so these are the milestones that they work on over the course of the year. And to give you a sense of how that lays out on the timeline, if this is a one-year timeline, the first three months are primarily occupied by that summer training series that I mentioned. Um, and we also ask them at this time, the research impact professionals are focusing on completing these initial surveys that our evaluation team uses to assess the efficacy of the program. Um, into fall semester, they really start digging in on the milestones. Um, developing the partner database I mentioned, developing the website I mentioned, and then planning and even starting to deliver workshops at their institution and beginning the consultations. And then through spring, uh, we ask them to really work on completing the milestones. Um, so they're doing more workshops, they're doing more consultations, they're hopefully finishing up the partner database and the other resources. Um, at the end of the year, they repeat these um, self-efficacy surveys and landscape analyses that they did at the beginning. Um, and then they essentially graduate uh, at the next year's summit. So the co cohort we're bringing in now will graduate at next year's summit. 
the cohort that's just finishing up now, we will be acknowledging this afternoon at our award ceremony as graduating from this past cohort of ORA. Um, the other thing that RI professionals are doing over the course of the year is that they're meeting every month with their admin partner. And what we found is that this connection between admin partner and research impact professionals is essential uh, for success of the program at that institution. So we, um, we expect them to meet monthly with their admin partners, and then we do um, a bi-monthly check-in with the ARIS training staff to provide ongoing support and mentorship uh, for the RI professionals. And in the meantime, the admin partners are, um, we ask them to uh, hold these monthly meetings with their RI pro team, but we also ask them uh, separately to have a, a group meeting, all the admin partners with Susan Reno. Um, as you know, Susan is sort of the person who got all of this started and is, is really um, the, you know, one of the leaders, if not the leader nationally and fact internationally in research impacts. And the office that she created at University of Missouri was really one of the first and um, most successful. And, and nobody knows more about um, how to sort of navigate the challenges um, both logistically and administratively in building up research impact infrastructure in their institution. And so these monthly meetings between the admin partners and Susan are really essential to helping the admin partners feel empowered to make changes within their institution. All right, um, I'm just about done and I wanna hand it off to Kristen, but I do, I do just wanna share a few observations that we've made through the first two cohorts. And again, Kristen's gonna be showing you more of the actual data, but just some general anecdotal observations that we've made over the past couple of years of doing this. One of the things we found right away was that a real key to the success was the community that we were trying to create within a cohort. So the community of RI professionals and also the bigger community um, of the entire cohort, RI professionals and, and admin partners, was not only essential for success, but proved to be a real strength with our first two cohorts. And we have every reason to expect that, that will continue to be an important piece of this. Um, as I mentioned, we hadn't originally conceived of the RI Pro uh, professional working in a, a team setting, multiple RI professionals at a single institution, <clears throat> excuse me, but we were open to that and it's proved to be a really popular and successful approach. And as I said, there are still some institutions that choose to have a single RI Pro, but um, what we're seeing, the trend seems to be that more and more have a team of two to three RI Pros, and that seems to be working really well. Um, Throughout this entire process, we've tried really hard to be flexible and open to new ideas. And um, I feel that that has been a key to having this program really get up and running and, and working well, is that we observed that every single member of, of our cohort was taking a slightly different approach to research impacts at their institution. And so the flexibility on our part to support them in whatever way they needed to grow was, was really a key to, I think, them feeling that they were getting the support they needed from us. Um, and again, I've mentioned this RI team, research impact team approach, which is a combination of RI professionals and admin partners. And we feel that this has proved critical to the success of ORIC as well. It really takes not just the boots on the ground, but the people at the administrative level to be that champion and that, that supporter and advocate for enhancing RI infrastructure at the institution. Um, and finally, a common theme that we've heard from, from several members of our cohorts is that ORIC has allowed them to really um, change language and attitudes and, and drive this change within their institution and how, how their institution thinks about research impacts and research impact support. And so, um, you know, our goal is to continue to have ORIC be that, that sort of catalyst for driving that conversation. So finally, I just want to acknowledge the participants in the past cohorts, um, the pilot study and cohort one uh, we had five institutions in our pilot study and six in our cohort, our first cohort. You can see all of those here. Um, we'll be mentioning, acknowledging cohort one today during the award ceremony, breaking it down by name and mentioning each of the individuals. And then quickly, just want to announce, we just officially announced this about a week or two ago, but we are just getting underway with cohort two and we expanded it. We have nine institutions in cohort two and we are really excited about um, getting going with them as well. So with that, I took a couple minutes longer than I intended, I apologize, but I'm gonna stop sharing and um, 
If people have any quick questions about anything I shared, um, I'm happy to answer them now. In the meantime, Kristen's gonna go ahead and share her screen and share with you some information uh, from the evaluation of ORIC. But does anybody, while she's doing that, does anybody have any quick questions about ORIC or anything I've covered so far? Again, feel free to unmute or raise your hand electronically and we can call on you. Okay, well, if there are no questions now, we, as I said, we will have time at the end for Q&A for Kristen, myself, and there's several sort of ORIC alumni on this call as well. So you can ask questions of them if you'd like to. But with that, um, I'll hand it over to Kristen, who's gonna tell us um, some of the findings from the evaluation work they've been doing. And are you seeing the right screen, the full screen view? Yep, looks great. Um, so as Joy said, I'm Kristen O'Connell at the Science Education Resource Center. Um, the, we really have been using three main tools um, to evaluate the ORIC program. And Joy's already, already described the landscape analysis uh, report, and that is a pre-post instrument. Um, then there is the research impacts institutional assessment survey, which is a retrospective pre-post. Um, and then there's the research impacts self-efficacy survey, and that's a pre-post post. And I will explain what I mean <laughs> by each of those as I go through the slides. Um, so starting with the uh, landscape analysis, um, RI professionals in the work program are asked to complete two landscape analyses, um, one at the beginning and one at the end. Um, and this, the goal of this is to understand how the landscape, well, it's twofold. One, it is this is one of the types of items where the evaluation is part of the intervention, right? It's creating an opportunity to reflect on their institution and the resources um, at this point at the beginning. Um, and that is an important reflective step for them. And it also gives us this evaluation data um, about how their landscape changes um, after participating in the program. So we follow up in the spring. So cohort one will be receiving their follow-up survey soon. Um, and the pre-post data from the pilot program um, has obviously been collected. And then we have the pre-data from cohort one. Um, in each report, the RI professionals are asked to do three main things. So they're asked to provide a description um, of the degree to which a variety of resources are currently available to faculty and staff who are interested in research impacts work. This could include consultation services or a database of research impacts partners. Um, then they're asked to describe the strengths in making research impacts work visible and functional and to discuss opportunities for increased visibility and functionality. So this is an opportunity to envision what, wh where are we at and where could we go? Um, and then finally, they're asked to describe the weaknesses or challenges um, in making research impacts work visible and functional and to discuss barriers uh, for making those improvements. So the pilot cohort reported um, in, when we looked at the pre to the post in the pilot cohort, which is the one that we have post data for already, um, we saw reported increased in BI consultations happening on their campuses, website resources, uh, professional development opportunities, identification and or documentation of potential RI partners and increases in RI staff and that was both in terms of FTE of individuals that were already working there and uh, new personnel. There was all, uh, sorry, I, I am, I have, was I speaking to the wrong slide? That's so funny. Uh, sorry. Um, so the pre-program RI landscape also gave us an idea of um, where the challenges that uh, cohorts might encounter um, and that those are on the order of the RI team is often limited to propo limited to proposal development. Um, there were limited evaluation resources. There were mechanisms for reporting and 
um, interacting with each other. Um, so silos in existence and a lack of clear incentives for working on RI work. Then there is the Research Impacts Institutional Assessment Survey, and this is the one that is a retrospective pre-post. Um, and if anybody wants to go into methods, I can talk about that later in the Q&A of why we chose to do that as ret retrospective. But it means that they um, report on the pre-state and the post-state at the on one survey at the end. Um, and this is a 13 item survey with questions such as, uh, researchers at my institution value research impacts efforts, or there's a clear strategy for increasing the visibility of research impacts efforts. Um, so those types of questions. Of those 13 items, um, 11 of them are part of a scale on a, this sort of Likert style scale. And um, those Seven, uh, so those 11 hang together as a scale, and the change from pre to post was statistically significant. Um, then you can look at the individual items, and seven of the individual items showed significant, statistically significant gains, and two of those items had particularly large gains. Um, so those are there is a clear strategy for increasing the visibility of research impacts efforts at my institution. And there are adequate resources at my institution to effectively support researchers as they plan research impacts efforts. So that's a really um, just what we would hope to see there. So it's consistent with the conclusion that the professional development opportunities associated with ORIC are effective in bolstering perceptions of research impacts capacity at the institution. Um, among both the RI professionals and the administrative partners. And then the final instrument is this self-efficacy survey. Um, and this is the one that's done pre-post-post. -post. <laughs> um, so it was developed for RI professionals involved in the ORC program specifically. Um, so this was a short list of capabilities in regards to research impacts work. Um, and there are other sessions that were part of the summit this year talking about uh, an effort to look at a bigger list of competencies. So you can go back and watch those recordings if you missed the sessions. But this is a short set that were just for the ORIC group. Um, and the RI professionals were asked to respond to each item, such as, I am confident in my ability to identify key individuals and programs at my institution that can contribute to a sustainable research impacts infrastructure. And that was on a five-point Likert scale from strongly disagree to strongly agree. Um, and the baseline survey was administered at the beginning of the workshop series that Jory was talking about. And the first post is right after that workshop series. And the second post is at the end of the whole year program. So that's why it's called a pre-post post. Um, and here are from the pilot program where we have the pre-post and the second post. Um, you'll see that the um, in the beginning, the range of responses was really wide ranging um, for individuals. Um, and you can see that the mean goes up over time and the range tightens up over time. So we're not seeing those really low scores in the second post survey. Um, and we did a repeated measures ANOVA um, on these data where time is the within subjects variable. So time was found to be um, statistically significant factor in as these increase um, with a large effect size. Um, so those findings are consistent with the conclusion that the professional development opportunities associated with the ORIC program are effective uh, in bolstering self-efficacy um, around RI competencies. Um, and I have a slide with the individual, um, I'll, maybe I'll just show this last slide. And I know you can't read these and that the text is tiny, um, but what is interesting to look at is sort of the shape of the data. So the 
you'll see that there's a baseline survey is in this sort of grayish greenish color and you'll see these wide range of means so there are some items where there was sort of a ceiling effect where they started high and stayed high and i guess it, it's probably not surprising that the item i understand the rationale for emphasizing research impacts on society that was high to begin with and it stayed high stayed high um, where there are where there are some items where we're seeing more growth um, so that is it's nice to look at in more detail and i know you can't read this here but we'll these slides will be um, part of the the information you can get from the summit website i think Great. Well, thank you so much, Kristen. Um, as you can see, this is a work in progress. We are continuing to collect data from the, the um, we'll start still collecting from cohort one, which is just wrapping up and just at the beginning of collecting data from cohort two, which is just getting started. So, um, you know, our plan is to continue to collect these data and learn from them and um, share them again with you at next year's summit with an update on how we're doing. Um, just to sort of generally summarize, we've been pleased with the feedback, both through the data we've collected and anecdotally from the people we've been working with. Um, and, you know, I, I sort of gave you anecdotally some of the key findings that I took away. And, and one that I would just want to reemphasize is this community feeling. Um, in fact, I just got an, an email today from one of the pilot cohort members who said, uh, let's, let's continue to keep this community going and let's, let's organize some events in the near future to, to get get the old gang back together, essentially. So, um, you know, we really, uh, one of the things you hear over and over within the ARIS community in general is we have this line that we always use about how people come to, to our summit and say, we found our people, I found my people. And, um, and so community is just a consistent theme, I think, throughout, uh, throughout ARIS's work and we really saw this um, emphasized with Aura. So that's been a, a key point that uh, I think will continue to be a strength of Aura. Um, all right, so we have about 20 minutes left. And what I'd like to do now is I'd love to just open it up to conversation and questions and answers. In addition to myself and Kristen, we have several members here of um, who participated as research impacts professionals um in the pilot cohort as well as cohort one which is just finishing up and we have several members of the incoming or cohort two so um if you don't mind turning your cameras on and i see a few of you have already done that so rod williams um is at purdue university and was part of the pilot study is a cohort member there um i'm going on the order of my screen miles mcnall um who i mentioned in chat was is at Michigan State and was a, a member of the Michigan State RI professional team in the pilot cohort. Um, let's see, who else do we have? Kevin Meskill is at Indiana University and is part of the incoming cohort. So he's just getting started. Um, I think I saw Carter somewhere. Um, Carter, are you still here? Or did you drop off? It looks like Carter maybe dropped off. Um, Pearl September, I, I'm guessing Pearl, is that Pearl September Brown? Is that you? Oh, yep, there you are. Um, so Pearl September Round was a, an RI professional from University of the Western Cape in South Africa. Uh, and Cornell Hart, welcome Cornell, was an admin partner with that program. Um, in, and that was, those were in cohort one, so the one that's just finishing up. And I apologize if I'm missing anyone, but I think you get the idea. There's, there's lots of folks here from all different phases of Oric, And so I'm sure any of us, would, oh, and Virginia Kearney, I just noticed who's at Baylor who's part of the incoming cohort as well. So um, if you have questions about, you know, the application process and, you know, maybe questions for Kevin and Virginia who are who were just accepted, they could answer questions about how they approach applying to the program. If you have questions about, you know, lasting effects of it and impacts some of the past participants. So I'm just gonna open it up in, in the remaining 15 minutes to any questions or comments that anyone has for any of us. Um, so um, any questions? And actually, while we wait for people to be shy and overcome that shyness, if any of the people that I just introduced have general comments or thoughts that they'd like to share, please feel free to unmute and sort of jump in. But yes, Kyle, you have a question. I tried to wait as long as I could and do that counting for give other people a chance, but 
Um, so first, um, a little bit of a comment. I've been at two institutions, one Oregon State University, which is a land grant, pretty under-resourced um, university that does an amazing amount of work given their, um, their funding. And then at Stanford, a really highly resourced um, university. And I'm really struck by Ex how the issues are exactly the same. So in your survey where you um, your results showed we're having uh, trouble getting the word out or you know all of those, the verbiage would be exactly the same from programs at OSU and at Stanford. So I think that you've really identified the, the most important elements for um, establishing research impacts at universities. So first, kudos to you, and I think that you're on the right track. Um, then next, um, at Stanford, there the way this is organized is in a research development office. And it was realized last year that proposals are becoming more competitive, or you know, we're going to establish this research development office to support faculty. They hired six new people to do research development, and that is a big chunk of change. So um, in this process, broader impacts wasn't really a factor in any of the people that they hired. And I'm here and I really um, satisfy that role, but they weren't even taking that into account. So um, one of the things, so I wanna identify um, a communication and, and um, with the upper administration uh, the importance of that and, and the challenge of that, because you come out as being self-promoting and tooting your own horn and I speak for the trees kind of thing. And um, so I think that that is, that is a challenge. And I am looking forward to going through the training next year. So um, my question to the people who have participated already is, how are the, what is the infrastructure for supporting research development at your institution? Okay, so we have this new research development office. Where did you, what was your interaction with this infrastructure and how did you strengthen those connections? Kyle, thanks for the, the comment and the great question. And um, before I turn it over to my colleagues to respond to that question, I just wanna apologize. I missed one person, Priscilla Daniels, who was, also at University, University of Western Cape and was another one of the RI professionals there. So sorry about that, Priscilla, and welcome. Thank you for being here. So we've got a big group of people who can respond to that great question, Kyle, and the floor is open to respond. So <clears throat> Kyle, um, at, at Michigan State University, um, also a land grant institution like Oregon State, um, our um, broader impacts team, um, although it's not formally called, that really is a collaboration between our outreach and engagement office and our um, research and innovation office, uh, which is where the research devel development professionals are. So a very strange thing happened in the middle of our ORIC experience, and that is that, that they let several of those people go. So our institution actually moved in the opposite direction from Stanford. We moved from having several research development professionals to having basically two. They're, they're highly skilled people, um, and, but they are, they are rather overwhelmed. But <clears throat> we found that, that that partnership is really a strength of our approach uh, because we bring the, the public engagement side of, of research impacts uh, together with the people who help with proposal development. And, and I think that's, that's um, really um, allowed us to provide a rich array of, of supports to our faculty. That, that's really great to hear because we also established um, a Office of Community Engagement last year because it was recognized, Stanford's been really criticized for not having um, a big, well-published impact for the surrounding communities, but those, that is, I, am pre I appreciate that idea because those two offices, research development and community engagement are very, very separate. It's an interesting idea to kind of try to bridge those two. Rod, uh, do you have a comment? 
Yeah, I was just going to say very similar to MSU here at Purdue, we've partnered with our executive vice president for research and partnerships and the office of engagement. And one of the things that we sought to do early on is make sure that we use the same language when we're working with faculty and staff for extramural funding across the university, because sometimes those two offices said things a little bit differently and approached and emphasized things a little differently. So we've, we've married the approach between those two offices to be much more consistent and elevate each component of, for example, NSF grants uh, equitably as we're working with faculty and staff as they go through the various uh, trainings and workshops that both offices offer. I'll just add really quickly, this question actually just came up in a conversation we were having yesterday with some members of the new cohort, which is, the question was, where, where do you mostly see the RI professionals living at different institutions? And my response was that in general, most of the time they seem to either come from the research development area or the uh, sort of engagement outreach extension area. Um, the, that's not always the case, but I'd say generally, it's um, the RI pros that, that are part of our ORIC program tend to be situated in one of those two areas. And, um, you know, this is part of why I've said repeatedly that we try to be really flexible and recognize that every institution is going to be on a different journey with this. And that's because there, there is no blueprint. And, you know, a lot of schools are trying to do it in different ways, starting in different offices. And, um, you know, and so we just try to support people in from whichever uh, kind of on-ramp they're coming to this. So, Jory, I'll, I'll jump in and, and at least provide the example from the University of Arizona, which was not part of ORIC, um, but largely because we were able to establish, we, we were part of um, ARIS training um, that was conducted here at the university, and, and that actually helped us to promote uh, broader impacts as a separate and distinct uh, component of the research development franchise. Uh, and so right now, um, I guess it was probably two and a half, almost three years ago that, Jory, you were on our campus alongside a, a few others. And we, we actually used that to help make the case for the fact that we needed dedicated professionals um, and that they could come from the research development space, but that we needed people that were doing both pre and post award work. Um, and in research development, which is the world that I'm in and sit in um, today, we just do the pre-award, right? The pre-pre-award activities. And so the person that runs our, our BI office um, actually came from my shop um, and that helped us to also clarify what's in the realm of that office versus what's in the realm of the research development office. And we work very closely um, on particularly large center proposals, career proposals, things along those lines. Um, but we, we, do, we do different pieces of it. Um, and, and, you know, we're lucky that we are in a well-resourced R1 land-grant institution and that our senior VP for research, which is where we both sit, um, has enabled us to, to continue that work. That helps. Great, thanks for that comment, Kim. And I'll, I'll just add, um that I, as of a few months ago, I transitioned to full-time with ARIS, but for most of the last um, eight or so years, I was dividing my time between ARIS and a position at Duke University. I'm based here in North Carolina. And one of the things I did at Duke was to set up an office of research impacts, broader impact support there. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I was based in um, something called this Initiative for Science and Society. Uh, and so, you know, I, I have the perspective of having set up an office as well. And, um, you know, I think that where you're situated within your institution really plays a crucial role in the, the progress you're able to make a, as an office or as a research infrastructure, research impact infrastructure support network. Because, um, it, you know, if you are spanning several colleges, institutions, centers, departments, then you can have that sort of institution-wide impact. But historically, a lot of these things have kind of arisen organically, almost as grassroots types of things within a college or within a, a, a center. And, um, and so the big challenge there is taking it from a service that supports one part of 
the campus to something that can support the entire campus. So um, we, that's a conversation that comes up a lot within ORIC is how do we take what we've been doing within say the College of Engineering and now apply that across the entire institution. Other comments or questions? There, there was a comment put in chat sent to me directly. Um, Laura, I'm not sure I entirely understand what you're asking. So could I invite you to unmute and, and restate the question? Sure. Sorry, Jory, I didn't know it. It only sent to you. So I just was wondering about the RI partnerships. I know that you have the evaluation going on. I wasn't sure if the evaluation is documenting those partnerships or the practices that are used to create those partnerships, especially if they reach outside of the institution. So I'll post the question for everyone, but that's the heart of it. Jory, does that make sense? Um, I Think so, Kristen. Do you have, as the evaluator, do you have some uh, kind of official response to that? Um, <laughs> uh, well, I think the landscape analysis is documenting um, documenting what it, it is, but it's not documenting the how as much. So mm -hmm. there, there are open ended items on that landscape analysis where people can explain more, but we don't, we haven't specifically called out what mechanisms did you use to create the, <laughs> these new contacts? So that could be an interesting um, idea of um, something that we could add to that. Yeah, so I'll just add, we give um, ORIC participants a template for creating the landscape analysis. And there are several categories and many of the categories are internal to within the institution and then there's a category which is, you know, beyond your institution, throughout your community, what are some of the resources and, and potential partnerships that exist there? And so we do break it down in that way. And um, we ask people when they're, when they're participating in ORC and thinking about the landscape for RI support at their institution to think not just within their institution, but beyond, um, you know, local, uh, I don't know, zoos and science centers and uh, you know, summer science camps and those types of uh, potential partners for research impacts work that, that aren't housed within their institution. Um, and, you know, maybe some of my colleagues here who've already completed an RI landscape uh, analysis of their campus might have something to add um, about the process. I mean, you know, did you learn about resources by, by sort of being forced to do this landscape analysis that you weren't aware of previously? Um, any any thoughts on that from Rod or Miles or um, the folks from Western Cape or anyone else might want to share? So I'll, I'll take a first stab at it. So short answer is yes. We learned of some connection points that existed in certain units within Purdue. It's a big place that we didn't think about before, specifically in the valuation space. So we were able to connect certain colleges and entities and units and people within those spaces to the broader uh, ARIS community here at, at Purdue. So absolutely, it was a really great exercise for us. And we, we were one of those institutions that had this pro team approach. So we were fortunate to have people all across the university on the team when we went through that pilot study and they were instrumental. That's one of the strengths I thought came from that team approach is they knew components and pieces of the university that I wasn't familiar with outside of my college or set of colleges. So that was really helpful for us to make those connections. Thanks, that's terrific. Miles. Yeah, the, the landscape uh, analysis, similar to what, to what Rod just said, was um, really instrumental in helping us um, establish a more um, robust and comprehensive referral network. So with, when you think about the people who are, who are sitting down with faculty, think about writing their broader impacts plan, it's, it's useful to know, you know who are their potential partners uh, both on and off campus. And um, you know, our combined experience really, really allowed us to make a much more robust network to say, well, look, if you want to do K-12 work, we have this connection to this local school district. Here's a faculty member who's already done work. And besides, we have the, you know, the MSU Museum that brings K-12 audiences onto campus on a regular basis. I love that example. Thank you very much. Thanks, Miles. Um, 
so there was a question about slides. I've already posted mine in the summit website. I think Kristen, you're planning to post yours as well. Is that correct? Um, and again, you know, my email address is on my slides, and you're always most of you probably know how to track me down already. But um, you're always welcome to reach out to me by email if you have more questions about this. I'll just put my email address in um, chat again, so you have it. It's just Dory at Duke.edu. Um, but we are just about out of time. I'm happy to um, stick around for a few minutes. I do want to encourage everybody to attend the keynote, which is coming up uh, in an hour, Jean. Is that right? I think it's coming up in an hour. Yes, Jean's nodding her head. Um, and that should be great. It's Dr. Jedida Eisler from the White House Office of Science, Technology, and Policy. So that'll be a great keynote. Um, and then our award ceremony after that. So please consider attending that as well. We'll be acknowledging the current cohort of work folks who are finishing up as well as the incoming cohort. Um, I wanna thank you all for attending and especially the org folks who attended and shared their perspective. Uh, Kristen, thank you for helping out. I should mention that um, she was in, drafted into doing this at the very last minute. It was gonna be Ellen Ar Iverson and then Ellen couldn't make it at the last minute. So Kristen did a great job on very little uh, advance notice. So thank you for being flexible and being able to join us with that. So. Um, thanks to all of you for participating. And like I said, I'm happy to stick around for a couple minutes if people have additional questions. And for those of you who aren't part of ORC, we hope to get applications from you in the future. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye.